Before we commence our program, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer and ask God's Spirit to be here with us. Father in heaven, we ask that your Holy Spirit will guide us in our study today. What we learn may help us in our Christian walk, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The topic this afternoon is the subject, God, the Gospel Expanded. We previously looked at the question of how we can be saved. And I want today to expand this topic because it's a large topic, a very important topic, probably one of the most important topics in all the Bible. <clears throat> the gospel is a vast mine, as it were, where we can dig and find precious jewels, uh, <clears throat> gospel truths, and things that bless us and help us in our living. The history of this particular lecture goes back to the time when I was teaching at Avondale College, and the faculty were having a retreat at the commencement of a new school year of uh, teaching. And I was asked to present a topic to the faculty on the question of the gospel, because it was a time when there was much discussion going on in the Adventist church about the gospel and how we would be saved. And some theories were going around that uh, were not based entirely on the Bible, uh, doctrines of perfectionism and the opposite, of course, liberalism. And so I was asked to give this study to the faculty and I gave it to them and it was well received so much so that the faculty voted that it should be made available to all the students of the college, uh, which I was able to do. <clears throat> we are living in a period of history when many in the Seventh-day Adventist Church are showing a renewed interest in the great themes connected with the plan of salvation. Of particular interest in, is the question, how do these doctrines affect mankind? I hope that in this study today we might be encouraged and able to meet and answer some of the questions that people are asking, and some of those questions are difficult ones. It may be a help for the reader to engage in further study on this topic individually as well. <clears throat> I propose to set forth 10 propositions which I believe we as Seventh-day Adventists ought to agree. We'll look at these 10 propositions one by one, giving first the Bible evidence and support, and then backing it up with the statements that we find in Spirit of Prophecy writings that confirm what we find in the Bible. <clears throat> it may seem at times when some of these pillars of truth are presented that there's a tension between it and other statements. This is not uncommon in the study of theology, and one must seek for solutions of the problems that may arise. Someone has suggested that if the gospel is being correctly presented, there will be times when we sound a little bit like antinomianists, or another time when we sound the opposite, legalism. It is proposed that as each topic is presented, as I said, we will look first at Bible evidence and then at Spirit of Prophecy statements. Proposition number one. Mankind was created sinless in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 1 tells us that when God created the world, he said, behold, it was very good. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 29 says, God made man upright. And Ellen White in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 4445, wrote, Man's nature, when he was created, was in harmony with God's will. Note that a man was created perfect in nature in order that God would allow him to live forever, he still had to develop a perfect character. And this is where Adam and Eve failed. Later, man, with God's help, has to develop a perfect character 
so that God can then restore him to a state with a perfect nature. And this will take place at the second advent when Jesus returns. Proposition number two. In the fall, mankind lost his sinless nature and became sinful in nature. Genesis 3 tells us man came to know good and evil. In Psalm 51, verse 5, David wrote, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He's not saying here that his mother sinned by having him and giving birth to him, but that he was born sinful because of the inheritance that he had. Further, we read in Psalm 58 and verse 3, that the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. In Isaiah 48 and verse 8, we read that the house of Jacob, that is, believers, are called transgressors from the womb. Psalm 14, 1 to 3 says, that There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And in Ephesians 2, verse 1, it says that the natural man is dead in trespasses and sins. And in verse 12, we read that they are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. In Romans chapter 7, Paul describes his condition as a believer, where he wrote, I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. What I hate... That I do. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. The good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I would not, that I do. He also said in verse 17 that it was sin that dwelleth in him. And right here we might elaborate on that just a little bit and come back to it again later on. See, some people get into difficulty because they have a faulty concept of the Bible definition of sin. If you ask most Christians, what is sin? The answer is given, 1 John 1, 9. Sin is the transgression of God's law. That is true. That's talking about actions. But here is a verse where Paul said, sin that dwelleth in me. That is not actions. That's talking about his condition, his state. We are sinners by nature because of our inheritance. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost their sinlessness and became sinful. And they could not then give to their children that which they had lost. Their children all inherited the sinful, carnal nature about which the Bible speaks so freely. Great Controversy highlights this when Ellen White wrote, page 505, When man transgressed the divine law, his nature became evil and was in harmony and not at variance with Satan. There exists naturally no enmity between sinful man and the originator of sin. Further, she wrote that Christians will feel the promptings of sin. And every Christian who has given his heart and his life to Jesus in reflection would say, yes, that is true. We feel the promptings of sin from within. Acts of the Apostles 5, 1, 18, Evils without awaken evils within. There is within us the sin principle that we have inherited from our parents. And the SDA Bible Comedy, Volume 2, page 1031, 1032, Ellen White comment wrote, As long as life shall last, there is need of guarding the affections and passions with a firm purpose. There is inward corruption. Further, she wrote, When the feelings and desires of the natural heart are contending for the victory, the struggle that we have trying to live the Christian life, and the carnal nature is trying to assert itself. She also wrote that Paul's will, the Apostle Paul, his will and his desires every day conflicted with duty and the will of God. 
Instead of following inclination, he did God's will, however crucifying to his own nature. That's in Testimonies to the Church, volume 8, page 313. And there's Signs of the Times article, March 23, verse uh, 1888, she wrote, We cannot say I am sinless till this vile body is changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. That, of course, takes place at the second coming. And in the Desire of Ages, 122-123, she wrote, In our own strength, it is impossible for us to deny the clamors of our fallen nature. That's why we need God's help in order to live the Christian life as he wants us to do. And Steps to Christ says, Even after our conversion, we still recognize our sinfulness if we do not see our own moral deformity, it is evidence that we have not seen the beauty of Christ's character. You see, throughout the history of the Adventist Church, unfortunately, there have been those that have come up and tried to teach the doctrine that in living the Christian life, you can get rid of the carnal nature before the second coming of Jesus. Doctrine of what we call perfectionism. And these statements from the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy make it very plain that that is a false hope. We have a battle day by day to live the Christian life and guarding against the temptations that come from within as well as the temptations that come from without. Now I move on to proposition number three. Jesus was the only one the only son of Adam, not to have inherited a sinful nature or sinful propensities. Now this is a, what we might say, an area where there has been some controversy in recent years. Unfortunately, there are some who disagree with that proposition, but I want you to listen carefully to what I have to say because the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy are very clear on this, and I have a, another study which I plan to present later on when I deal with the incarnation of Jesus and his coming to this earth as a human being, born as a babe in Bethlehem, where I'll explore this topic more fully and give you further evidence. But at the moment, let's look at what the Bible has to say. In John 8, verse 46, Jesus challenged the Pharisees and those around him with the words, Which of you convinceth me of sin? Now, of course, that was a challenge for them to point to some sinful action. And they could not do that. Because the Bible tells us, Jesus did know sin. 1 Peter 2, 22. <coughs> That is a clear statement about his actions. He did no sin. But 2 Corinthians 5.21 says something just a little bit different. It says, He knew no sin. That's referring to his nature, not to his actions. <laughs> he knew no sin. Hebrews 7.26 tells us, Jesus' nature was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And 1 John 3, verse 5, it clearly states that Jesus had no sin in him. I quote the words, in him was no sin. That's talking about his nature, not his actions. Jesus, according to that text, had no sinful propensity or urges. Pilate exclaimed, I find no fault in him. Pilate's wife said, have nothing to do with that just man. The angel Gabriel said that Jesus was that holy thing. The devils called Jesus the Holy One of God. Jesus said, John 14 verse 30, that Satan had nothing in him. There was nothing in Jesus that Satan could use to get at him through his nature to make him transgress. Now we come to a text in Romans 3, uh, Romans 8, verse 3, rather, 
in, he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And some people use that as a text to try and prove that he had a carnal nature. Some commentators, however, have pointed out that likeness is not the same as sameness. Now let's look at some spirit of prophecy evidence. Questions in Doctrine, page 55. Jesus took the nature, that is human nature, but not the sinfulness of man. Yes, he was 100% human, just as Adam was when he was created, but Jesus did not take, she says, the sinfulness of human nature. She wrote, Questions on Doctrine, page 649, no one looking at Jesus could say that he was just like other children. Well, you know, as we've seen already that the Bible says that we are born sinners by nature, and those of you who have children will know that uh, a baby of just a few weeks old can show signs of temper. And stiffen out their little arms and legs and scream and show that they're angry. Of course, you didn't do that when you were a baby, did you? <laughs> Go and ask your parents, they'll confirm what you did. <laughs> yes, we all show signs of that kind of human nature, but Jesus, she says, no one looking at Jesus could say that he was just like other children. There are many quotations in these pages that uh, also confirm what I'm saying, that Jesus did not inherit sinful human nature. For example, Our High Calling, page 59. Jesus was sinless, with this exception, his condition was as yours. Now, any of Ellen White's statements that seem to say otherwise must be understood in the light of the above quotation. Statements that say that Jesus took our fallen nature then can refer to our weakened physical human nature and not to the carnal nature with which we are all born. Her statement in the Desire of Ages, page 49, where she writes about Jesus accepting the working out of the law of heredity. For example, we sometimes think that Adam was much taller than men of today are. Some have suggested he might have been about 12 feet tall and weighed about one ton. That's a lot of man. We are not that big today. Sin has wrought havoc on the human race. Jesus accepted the outworking of the law of heredity. However, another possibility would be that he only took our sinful nature vicariously for purposes of the atonement, just as he took our sinful actions vicariously. See Isaiah 53, verse 6, where it says, The Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. 1 Peter 2, 24, that he bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He took our sinful actions vicariously. And this topic I would like to expand and develop even further in another chapter that I present later on, dealing with the incarnation and the human nature of Jesus. Proposition number four. Jesus lived a sinless life and died an atoning death, thus securing redemption for all who accept him. All right, his sinless life, we have already looked at that. But what about his atoning death? It's called a finished work. Many people talk about Jesus' finished work on the cross because they don't look upon him doing anything in heaven since he went up there. I have another study that I'll give later on dealing with the final atonement, which is a subject in itself so vast that I need a whole hour to talk about that one. <coughs> John 19, verse 30, Jesus said, It is finished. When Jesus uttered these words on the cross, he was referring to the work that he had come to this earth to do. It was now finished. He bowed his head and died. Scripture teaches that he later ascended to heaven and take, took up his work as our mediator and judge. These tasks are referred to in later chapters that I will discuss later on, later lectures. Hebrews 9 and verse 28 so it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins for many. 
And Hebrews 10.10 says that he was offered once for all. In verse 12 it says, One sacrifice for sins forever. The atonement made on the cross never has to be repeated. He, one offering he has perfected forever. <coughs> Them that are sanctified. <coughs> now look, let us look at supporting evidence from the writings of Ellen White. Desire of Ages. She wrote that when Mary worshipped Jesus, or went to worship Jesus, he held her back and said not to do it until he had received the assurance from his father that his sacrifice had been accepted. Later on, he accepted her worship. <clears throat> Desire of Ages, Ellen White wrote about Christ's completed work. What he did on the cross was a completed work. She wrote when Jesus ascended to heaven, I have completed the work of salvation or the work of redemption. And then in Acts of the Apostles, page 29, she wrote that Christ's sacrifice in behalf of man was full and complete. The condition of the atonement had been fulfilled. Our High Calling, page 136, she noted Jesus' offering of himself was full and complete. Nothing was wanted. When nothing was wanting, it was indeed a whole and ample atonement that was made. In a magazine article, Signs of the Times, June 28, 1899, she wrote in an article that type met anti-type with the death of Jesus, the lamb slain for the sins of the world. Our great high priest has made the only sacrifice that is of any value in our salvation. When he offered himself on the cross, a perfect atonement was made for the sins of the people. An offering is complete. <clears throat> Proposition number, number five. five. In justification, the sinner is declared righteous legally because the righteousness of Christ is put to his account. Let us look at Old Testament terms. The Old Testament word for justification is histic. In the majority of cases, it means to declare judicially that one's standing is in harmony with the demands of the law. In Deuteronomy 25, verse 1, judges were told to justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. The work of the judge is to declare that the innocent man is innocent. Other verses say the same thing. The meaning of these examples is strictly legal or forensic. The declaration pronouncing that the accused are innocent. Some deny this legal meaning, Seen, for example, in Roman Catholic teaching and in the exp exponents of the moral inference theory of the atonement, such as John Young and Horace Bushnell and the Unitarians, who teach that it to justify means to make righteous. When compared with evidence from the New Testament, it is clear that this position is not acceptable. Let's look at the New Testament then. The New Testament verb for justify is dikaio. And its common use is to declare that a person is just. For example, Matthew 12, 27, Luke 7, 29, and Romans 3, 4. In these verses, sinners are told to justify God. They, cannot, they can declare that God is just, but they cannot make God just, for he is already just. In Paul's epistles, the soteriological meaning is emphasized to declare forensically that the demands of the law as a condition of life are fully satisfied with regard to a person. And that's a quote from Systematic Theology by Burkhoff, page 510. And there are other verses in the New Testament that confirm what I've just said. Now let's look at the doctrine of justification in history. First of all, let us say that Paul, the Apostle Paul, and Bible writers, they got it right. They had a true understanding of it. Some early church fathers spoke of justification by faith, but many did not have a clear understanding of it. Justification and sanctification were often confused. Even Augustine did not seem to have it right. He, he did not seem to understand that justification was a legal act 
distinct from sanctification, even though he understood God's grace to be free and man's works uh, excluded. Through the Middle Ages, this confusion continued. The prevailing scholastic teaching was twofold. Firstly, man's sins were forgiven, and secondly, man was made just or righteous. The argument often raged as to which came first. Thomas Aquinas reversed the order, and his view became the accepted Roman Catholic position in Catholic theology, which teaches that grace is infused or put into a man. This makes him just. This makes him uh, accepted. And partly on this base, or this basis, his sins are pardoned. This was a step toward the teaching of merit, that a man is partly justified by his own good works. This further led to arguments over the question as to whether justification was God's instantaneous act or whether it was a process. Luther reacted against the idea of works having any part in justification. He taught that all believers could have direct access to God's grace through Christ. He encouraged works of righteousness as evidence of the Christian standing with God, which the Bible also clearly teaches. Justification by faith because became the great issue of the Protestant Reformation. Reformers separated justification and sanctification and stressed the legal aspects of justification, claiming that it was an act of God's free grace in which he pardons our sins and accepts us as righteous because before any inward changes or sanctification has taken place. Thus they rejected Rome's position. Reformers said that works have no part in justification. Man is counted righteous in the imputed righteousness of Jesus. They denied the concept of progressive justification. They taught that it was an instantaneous and complete act not depending on any sanctification for its completion. With this position, the Reformers, Ellen G. White, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church unequivocally stand together. Romans 5, 17 to 21. By obedience of one, that is Christ, many are made righteous. We call it righteousness by faith. In Romans 3.21, notice that it does not have the definite article T-H-E. It says, now a righteousness of God apart from law is revealed. And 1 Corinthians 6.11, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. The name in the Bible stands for character in the Bible. Christ's character is righteous and by that we can be justified. Man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That's in Romans 3, 28. And Galatians 3, verse 24, we're justified by faith, not by our works. Romans 4, 3, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And finally, Romans 9, verse 30, Gentiles received righteousness by faith, but Israel did not because they sought it not by faith, but sought it through works. Ellen White, in her book, The Desire of Ages, page 347, wrote, Faith is clasping the hand of God. The faith that is unto salvation is not a mere intellectual assent to the truth. The only faith that will benefit us is that which embraces him as a personal saviour, which appropriates his merits to ourselves. Many hold faith as an opinion, Saving faith is a transaction by which those who receive Christ join themselves in covenant relation with God. The story has been told about Blondin, the famous tightrope walker, who used to walk across a tightrope stretched across the front of the Victoria Falls. One day, as he was going back and forth with a wheelbarrow, he asked an admirer if he believed that he could wheel a man across in the wheelbarrow. The man said, yes, yes, I, I believe you could. Blondin then said, then get into the wheelbarrow. 
But the man declined. <laughs> he didn't get in. The moral, of course, is that real faith leads to action. Scripture says that we are justified by faith. In the Greek, it is rendered as dia pisteso, pisteos, or ek pistein, or the dative pistei. And several, Roman, uh, several verses in Romans and Galatians and Philemon give us the different uses of the Greek there. Dia stresses faith as an instrument by which we appropriate Christ and his righteousness. Ek shows that faith logically precedes our personal justification and the dative is used in an instrumental sense. Scripture never says we are justified dia ten piston on account of faith. If it did, it would be saying that our work of faith is meritorious. Faith is not the ground or basis of our justification. If it were, it would be a work of man. It's from Burkhoff's Systematic Theology again, page 520-521. In Romans 2 verse 4, Paul wrote of the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. In Acts 5 and verse 31, it says, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance itself is like a gift from God. We have the power to choose whether we will or whether we will not. Acts of the Apostles, we are told we must be willing to be made willing. That is, not our faith that saves us, but it is Christ who saves us. When a drowning man gets onto a rock and is saved, he does not claim that his legs and feet saved him, but that the rock was the cause of his salvation. Now further on justification, let's look at some things. Numbers 23. Here we have the story of Balaam, hired by King Balak to curse Israel just before they entered the promised land. God did not allow him to curse Israel, but he did his best to do so. And in one of the occasions as he was trying to curse, he uttered words of blessing instead, because God took control of his mind and his tongue. And in verse 21 of chapter 23, Numbers, I read these words. He, that is God, hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. This is a surprising text. Some years ago, I was on the Peel for Missions trip from Avondale College with some students and it was up in the city of the country town of Tenterfield. On Sabbath morning, I was reading a chapter from my Bible and this is the chapter that I read. And when I read that verse, it jumped off the page at me. God did not see sin in Israel. I thought, how could that be true? Here we have an example from the Old Testament that shows what justification means. Despite the sins of the children of Israel in the wilderness, and you know them as well as I do, the golden calf at Mount Sinai, complaining about the food, complaining about lack of water, complaining until that God sent snakes in to bite them, the rebellion of Korah, Dathan and Abiram, they swallowed up in an earthquake and buried alive. The next day the survivors came to Moses and waving their finger at him, they said, you have killed the servants of God. And God sent a plague and thousands died and Aaron had to run with the censer between the dead and the living and plead with God to stop the plague. And it was stopped. The record of the children of Israel in the wilderness wanderings is not a happy record. And yet on the borders of the promised land, God could say, I do not see any sin in Israel. That's amazing. That is the gospel. Because when we confess our sin, God then removes the guilt and looks upon us not as being forgiven sinners, but as being innocent. That reminds me of the statement of Steps to Christ, page 65 in my particular volume of that little book. Quote, If you give yourself to him and accept him as your saviour, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted as righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character and you are accepted before God just as if you had never sinned. 
It's one thing to be found guilty and then pardoned. But God goes the second mile. He says, now that you are pardoned, I declare you to be innocent. As far as I'm concerned, you did not even do the wrong. That's certainly good news. That's the gospel. Now I come to proposition number six. Our salvation depends on what God has done in Christ, Christ's living and dying, and not upon what God does in us. This may sound strange to some at first, but when it is analyzed, it will seem to be seen to be true. It does not deny sanctification, which is in our next proposition, coming up in a few minutes, but is stated here as to, so as to clarify the fact that Christ's imputed righteousness is the basis of our salvation. That is what gets us into heaven, the righteousness of Jesus, which is counted to us, credited to us. Sanctification, what God does in us, does not and cannot add anything to what God has done in Christ. That is why John Bunyan could quote 1 Corinthians 1.30, which says, Jesus is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He also claimed that his righteousness was in heaven because that's where the righteousness of Jesus is. It's up there. He's claimed by Bible scholars that the Bible uses the term righteousness by faith, equates it with justification, that sanctification is the fruitage of it. We'll do a further study on this great topic when I look at the history of the doctrine of righteousness by faith in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that's an interesting topic, which I'm looking forward to lecturing on sometime in the near future. <clears throat> now I come to proposition, proposition number seven. Sanctification will always follow justification and is the evidence and fruitage of it. Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, mercy, and so on. The Old Testament word kadesh, some say is related to the Hebrew word chadash, which has the meaning of to shine, which gives us the qualitative aspects of biblical holiness. The New Testament word hegiedzo, which means holy, Hence, separation from the world and all that is sinful. Let's now look at the history of the doctrine of sanctification in the Ad Christian church. Over the years, three questions have been considered. What is the relation of God's grace in sanctification to faith? Number two, what is the relation between justification and sanctification? And number three, what level of sanctification is possible in this life? During the early period of the Christian church, the church fathers, that's the pastors of the early Christian churches, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th century and so on, they said very little about sanctification. During, <clears throat> and believers were taught to depend for salvation on faith and good works. Sins committed before baptism could be washed away in baptism, and sins committed after baptism could be cancelled by penance and good works. People must live good lives to deserve God's approval. In this environment, many false theories arose. For example, wrong concepts of sin, legalism, sacramentalism, preached craft, and asceticism. Often, no clear distinction was made between justification and sanctification. Augustine. Augustine did not always distinguish between the two. He greatly influenced the Middle Ages. He included sanctification in justification and held to the doctrine of man's total depravity. Hence, sanctification was a supernatural impartation of the divine life, which operated only within the church and was imparted in the sacraments. That's why the Catholic Church teaches that there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church because you have to be in the Catholic Church to get the sacraments. Sanctification was a deposit of God in man, hence he failed to see the need of constant faith in Christ. Now we come to Thomas Aquinas. <clears throat> it seems that he often confused 
justification and sanctification, and combined the two. Sanctification was an infusion of divine grace into the soul. Thus man could be lifted to a higher plane and be able to better know God. All this was possible through the sacraments. From God's viewpoint, sanctification removed the original sin and imparted permanent habit of inherent righteousness <coughs> and carried within itself the ability of further development, even to perfection. Its good work could be undone by mortal sins. From man's viewpoint, the supernatural work of faith recommended man to God, which then secured for him an increase of grace. And so it went on in the circle. God imparted the grace, you came to a higher level, God was pleased, gave more grace, you came to a higher level, more grace, a higher level, and so you're climbing the ladder. And works as if we're involved in it. All this was thought of more as justification. However, and you'll find that in the Council and Decrees of the Council of Trent, a statement on their teaching. During and after the Protestant Reformation, most reformers made a clear distinction between justification and sanctification. Justification was the legal action of God's grace. It deals with man's legal status. Sanctification was a moral or regenerative work. Changing man from the inside, it is the fruitage of justification. They taught that man is justified by faith alone, but the faith that justifies is never alone. It's going to produce some results, some fruitage. <clears throat> the grace of sanctification was not regarded as an infused essence. <clears throat> Rather, it was primarily the work of the Holy Spirit through his, the Word, and only secondarily through the sacraments. They sought to avoid the idea of salvation by works. Then in Methodism, it stressed the fellowship of the believer with Christ. John Wesley spoke of entire sanctification, which he called the second blessing. However, he never claimed that he had it himself. Proposition number eight. Sanctification never eradicates man's sinful nature. Man's sinful nature will be eradicated when he is glorified at the second advent. In Philippians 3, 20 to 21, it says that our vile bodies will be changed at the second advent. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55, also says we'll be changed at the second advent. This corruption will put on incorruption. Titus 2, 11 to 14, says that the Christian is told to do deny worldly lusts. Therefore, they are still with us. Then, there will be no change in our bodies or natures when we are converted or at any time in the Christian life following conversion. The natural inclinations remain until glorification, but the Christian does not allow them to reign. It is true that because they are not indulged by a true Christian, the pull of the carnal nature, they become weaker, but they are not eradicated until glorification. At conversion, there will be, of course, changes, for we then receive a new spiritual nature. Jesus called it being born again. Jesus taught that we all need to be born again. <clears throat> Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now let's read what Ellen White has to say. Desire of Ages, page 391. The Word, that is the Word of God, destroys the natural earthly nature and imparts a new life in Christ Jesus. By the transforming agency of His grace, the image of God is reproduced in the disciple. He becomes a new creature. This statement must not be taken to mean the eradication of the carnal nature, that is, the sinful nature with which we are born, but the power of the carnal nature is broken so that it no longer dominates in the Christian life. As someone has well said, the carnal nature remains, but it does not reign. It is resident, but not president. It no longer dominates in the life. That I may know him, page 247. When a soul is truly converted, old habits and natural besetments are done away in Christ Jesus, 
and all things become new. Let no one declare, I cannot change my natural habits and tendencies. The truth must be admitted to the soul and it will work sanctification of the character. It will refine and elevate the life and fit for you and entrance into the mansions that Jesus has gone to prepare for those that love him. It has been said that when we are converted, we get a new spiritual nature and that the Christian life is then a battle between the old and the new natures. The old seeks to dominate and we have the power of choice as to which one we will obey. Evidence that we have a battle in the Christian life is clearly seen in Ellen White's writings in heavenly places, 297 to 98. She said, watch against the stealthy approach of the enemy. Watch old habits and natural inclinations, lest they assert themselves. Force them back and watch. There are the old natural temperaments to contend with, but these temperaments are to be brought into subjection to Jesus Christ. Paul claimed that he was the chief of sinners. My, why? Because he knew he had this battle going on, Romans 7, we've already talked about, where he says he does the things he doesn't want to do. Paul recognized the battle going on in his own life. He also described the battle that he had in daily life over his carnal nature in Romans 7, 14 to 20. An honest Christian would readily identify with him. In Heavenly Places, page 20, the Christian bravely and cheerfully engages in the warfare, fighting against natural inclinations and selfish desires and bringing the will into subjection to the will of God. She also wrote, the religion of Christ will bind and restrain every unholy passion. Hence, they are not eradicated in the Christian life when conversion takes place, but they have to be bound and restrained. And she says, so did the Apostle Paul fight against the temptations of Satan and the evil propensities of his carnal nature. Paul, the great Apostle Paul. Now come to proposition number nine. Because we remain sinners by nature till the second coming, we will never be perfect until the second coming. 1 Corinthians 15, this corruptible put on incorruption at the second coming. 1 John 2, 1, it notes that if a man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. For there is not a just man upon the earth who does not sin, Ecclesiastes 7:20. Just man, righteous man, but he still can sin. James 3, 2, in many things we offend all. In 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Ellen G. White highlighted this truth in her writings. Steps to Christ, page 65. Since we are sinful, unholy, we cannot perfectly obey a holy law. That's why we need the help of God to overcome Acts of the Apostles. So long as Satan reigns, we shall have self to subdue, besetting sins to overcome. So long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point where we can reach and say, I have fully attained. Sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience. None of the apostles and prophets ever claimed to be without sin. Men who have lived the nearest to God Men who would sacrifice life itself rather than knowingly commit a wrong act have confessed the sinfulness of their nature. They have put no confidence in the flesh, have claimed no righteousness of their own, but have trusted wholly in the righteousness of Christ. At every advanced step in our Christian experience, our repentance will deepen but let not God be dishonored by the declaration from human lips, I am sinless, I am holy. Sanctified lips will never give utterance to such presumptuous words. I remember the story of a man that was in a prayer meeting one time and he had a wrong concept of these subjects and he got up in front of the prayer meeting and walked back and forth and said, if you want to see someone who hasn't sinned for 20 years, look at me. And somebody in the back seat, in a loud whisper, said, he's sinning right now. 
First of all, he's making a false statement, bearing false witness, breaking one of the commandments and said not to bear false witness. And uh, indulging pride, another sin, and so on. Yeah. Selected messages, book one. The religious services, the prayers, the praise and penitent confession of sin ascending from true believers as incense to the heavenly sanctuary, but passing through corrupt channels of humanity, they are so defiled that unless purified by blood, they can never be of any value with God. Our prayers, our praise, our heartfelt confession of sin is not acceptable to God unless what? They ascend not in spotless purity and unless the intercessor who is at God's right hand, and that is Jesus, unless he presents and purifies all with his righteousness, they can be of no value to God. So Christ has put his righteousness with our confession and then they are acceptable to God. All incense from earthly tabernacles must be moist with the cleansing drops of the blood of Christ. Close quotes. That's what Ellen White wrote. She says, righteousness without a blemish can be obtained only through the imputed righteousness of Christ. In Great Controversy 621, she mentions during the time of Jacob's trouble, the earthliness of the saints will be consumed, that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. This statement makes it clear that the sealed saints are not in a state of sinless perfection, only a glorification does this situation be granted to them. Our high calling, 321, the time of Jacob's trouble is the trouble to, is the crucible that is to bring out Christian characters. It is designed to lead the people of God to renounce Satan and his temptations. The last conflict will reveal Satan to them in his true character, that of a cruel tyrant, and it will do for them what nothing else could do Uproot, the, from, uh, uproot him entirely from their affections. Great Controversy 631 says, The seal saints are in the time of Jacob's trouble are led to exercise faith, hope and patience which they have too little exercise during their religious experience. Joshua and the angel picture the condition of the church in the time of Jacob's trouble. They are fully conscious, she says, of their sinfulness, of their lives, they see their weakness and unworthiness and they look upon themselves, they are ready to despair. But we must stop looking to ourselves and look to Jesus. Sacrifice, self-denial and disinterested benevolence characterise his life and he is our pattern. He is a perfect and holy example given for us to imitate. And then notice what she says, we cannot equal the pattern because we've got carnal natures. But we shall be held responsible if we do not follow and according to our God-given ability, seek to imitate the example that he has given us. The perfection of the church depends not on each member being fashioned exactly alike. God calls for each one to take his proper place, to stand in his lot and to do the appointed work appointed there by them by God. To conclude this section, I want to quote a particular quote from Selected Messages, Book 1. When it is in the heart to obey God, when efforts are put forth to this end, Jesus accepts the disposition and effort as man's best service, and he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit but he will not accept those who claim to have faith and yet are disobedient to his Father's commandments. Now I come to proposition number 10. Despite the fact that we all have sinful human natures, we are to be perfect in character before probation closes. This means we are to overcome all known sin. The Bible and Spirit of Prophecy teach us that we are to be perfect now, the word perfect, of course, in the Greek language is the word teleos, which means mature, full-grown. Not quite the same meaning that we get when we use the word perfection. 
in the English language. It should be noted that in justification the believer is already guarded, regarded as perfect by God. So the Christian now is really being urged by God to live the way that God regards us. There is in sanctification a growth or development into full Christian maturity. It is interesting to note that the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy use the word perfection very often. And I've been particularly interested in this and so as I've read Spirit of Prophecy and I've read probably most of the books that are available, she uses that word and uh, gives us a picture of what it's meaning. Whenever she uses the word perfection, practically every time she qualifies it by saying, when she's talking about us as human beings, perfection of character. She never talks about getting perfection of nature before the second coming, but perfection of character. So I have studied this question for years. What is the perfection of character that God wants us to have? And I've come to one conclusion, and that is this. Perfection of character is that we would, in our Christian growth, will come to the place where we would rather die than knowingly commit a wrong act. I don't think God can ask more than that of us. In fact, the test in the last days of Revelation 13, the seal of God and the mark of the beast and the death test is a test to show that we have that character. God wants us to be holy. He says, be ye holy for I am holy. John 3, 1 John 3, 6, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. 1 John 3, 9 says that if we do sin, we have an advocate with God. Some years ago, we were having a meeting at Avondale College over these topics about perfectionism and so on. And one of my former classmates with whom I graduated from college uh, spoke to me after one of the sessions and said, oh, I thought you'd be with us 100%. I said, I can't endorse all that you teach. He said, what can't you endorse? I said, you're teaching of perfectionism. Well, he says, the Bible says, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. I said, do you know what the Greek says? He said, what? I said, in the Greek it reads, whoever is born of God does not go on sinning. Present continuous tense in the Greek. Puts a little different shade of meaning on it. We do not plan to sin. We do not make provision for sin. We do not make it a habit of sinning. Not that we never make a fall and have to be forgiven. God provides a way of escape from every temptation, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. And Elder White says, while we cannot claim perfection of the flesh, we may have Christian perfection of the soul. Our dependence is not on what man can do. It is on what God can do for man through Christ. Thank God we are not dealing with impossibilities. We may claim sanctification. And having become partakers of the heavenly gift, we are to go on to perfection, being kept by the power of God through faith. And then in Testaments of the Church, Volume 2, 400, it is impossible for those who indulge appetite to attain to Christian perfection. Oh, that's an interesting statement. Notice its importance in its role of the health reform in this regard. If we are not living up to what we know is God's will, Christ has given us assurance, she wrote, that obtained to perfection of character is no easy matter, is a conflict, a battle and a march, day by day. In God's amazing grace, page 141, perfection of character is attainable to everyone who strives for it. This is made the very foundation of the new covenant of the gospel. When Jesus comes, he is not to cleanse us then from our sins and our defects of our characters because that work must be done before that time. (laughs) 
The standard presented in the Old Testament is the same as that which is presented in the New Testament. This standard, she wrote, is not one to which we cannot attain. That's a good promise from God for us. God has made provision that we may become like unto him, and he will accomplish this for all who do not interpose a perverse will and frustrate his grace. Quoting from God's Amazing Grace, 134. As we contemplate God's call and consider the standard that he sets before us, we are all prone to ask, who is equal to these things? May we, maybe we ought to now to try to define just what it is, considering all the evidence that has been presented before. And I've already stated this. Perfection of character, not perfection of nature. But it maybe we ought to try to define just what it is, considering all the evidence that has been presented above, we could conclude that perfection of character that God's required is that the Christian will resolve with God's help and grace to choose to rather die than choose to do what he knows is wrong. That's perfection of character. And here's an interesting statement. Testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, page 18. The Lord Jesus is making experiments on human hearts through the exhibition of his mercy and abundant grace. He is effecting transformations so amazing that Satan, with all his, uh, uh, sorry, so amazing that Satan, with all his triumphant boasting, with all his confederacy of evil united against God and the laws of his government, stands viewing them as a fortness impregnable to his sophistries and delusions. They, God's people, are to him an incomprehensible mystery. That's what we can become under God's power and God's grace. A final quote from Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. God has pledged himself to do the work of sanctification in us if we cooperate with him. The choice is ours. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel that you have given to us. A roadmap for salvation. Grant that all who hear these words may find salvation in Jesus and a part in his kingdom is my prayer for his name's sake. Amen. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.